Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my video on respiration. Now before you watch this, make sure you are familiar with um, animal, plant and bacterial cells, the circulatory system and substance exchange, and also the chemistry stuff on rates of reaction. I've got videos on all of those things um, early in this playlist and on my uh, chemistry playlist if you need. Now, um, in this video, we will be looking at aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, cardiac output, the response of the body to exercise, and finally, the respiration core practicals. Now, let's start by looking at aerobic respiration. Now, respiration in general is an exothermic reaction that releases energy from glucose, and that energy is used to power you know, hundreds of, hundreds of different processes taking place in our cells all day, every day. Now, there are two main kinds, aerobic and anaerobic. We'll look at anaerobic next slide, but concentrate on aerobic respiration for now. So this is respiration that uses oxygen, and it takes place in the mitochondria of each of our cells. Now, the equation for this is very simple. Glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. Now, you'll note, although this, although this reaction releases energy, Energy is not written anywhere on the equation because energy is not a chemical and this is a chemical equation. Now, the energy released from respiration is used for a wide range of metabolic processes. That means chemical reactions really inside the body, including producing heat, enabling us to move, powering our digestion and building complex molecules that are needed for growth and repair. Aerobic respiration is a continuous process. It is faster and slower at different times of day, but it never stops. The point at which aerobic respiration stops is the point at which we all stop. It's death. Now, the main job, therefore, of the circulatory system and the respiratory system is to bring the glucose and oxygen to our cells to enable respiration in order to release the energy that we need to continue life um, and also to remove the carbon dioxide that is produced by that respiration. So really, all of our circulatory system is about making sure that respiration continues so we can continue to remain alive. Now, the other kind of respiration we've got is anaerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration is respiration that does not use oxygen. Rather than taking place in the mitochondria, this takes place in the cytoplasm of all of our cells. Now, the equation for this is even simpler than the equation for aerobic respiration. It is simply glucose becomes lactic acid. Now, this releases much less energy than aerobic respiration, but it releases it much, much faster. Um, and so this kind of serves as an energy boost on top of regular aerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration happens during intense exercise, you know, things like sprinting or lifting very heavy weights. It's an energy boost on top of aerobic respiration, not instead of it. So it's not the case that the aerobic respiration stops. It's just that we start doing anaerobic as well. Now, the lactic acid that is produced during anaerobic respiration is harmful to our cells and it produces a sensation of burning and tiredness in our muscles. So we can't respire anaerobically for very long. Essentially, the, the pain caused by the lactic acid quickly gets too much and it forces us to slow down and stop uh, the anaerobic respiration. The next thing we'll explore is the idea of cardiac output. Now, cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped by the heart every minute. Um, and it's calculated very simply using this equation. So the cardiac output equals the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Um, when, I'm, when I'm actually working through the examples, you'll see that I will initialize this to CO for cardiac output equals stroke volume SV multiplied by heart rate HR. Now, just to define those terms a little bit, the stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped by the heart each time it beats. And the heart rate is the number of times the heart beats each minute. 
So let's look at a couple of examples of the type of calculations you might need to do with this. Example one, calculate a person's cardiac output in decimeters cubed per minute if their stroke volume is 81 centimeters cubed and their heart rate is 78 BPM. Now the first thing I'm going to think about when I do this is, well, it's given me a volume in centimeters cubed, but it's asked for a cardiac output in decimeters cubed per minute. So let's convert that volume into decimeters cubed first. So I'm going to say volume equals 81 centimeters cubed divided by a thousand, because remember there are 1000 centimeters cubed in one decimeter cubed, and that would give me a volume, a stroke volume of um, 0 0.081 decimeters cubed. And that's what I'm going to use for my calculation. So then for my calculation, I'm going to say cardiac output CO equals stroke volume SV times by my heart rate HR. Now I'm not going to use the 81. I'm going to use the 0 0.81 I just calculated for my stroke volume. So I say 0 0.081 multiplied by my heart rate of 78 BPM. And that will give me a cardiac output of um, 6.318 decimeters cubed per minute, like that. Okay. Let's look at a second example. This time it will involve rearranging that equation a little bit. So let's let's try that as well. Now, so it says calculate a person's stroke volume. I'll put a little star next to that to show me that's what I'm finding. In centimeters cubed, if their cardiac output is 5,456 centimeters cubed per minute and their heart rate is 88 BPM. Notice each time I've underlined the values I'm using and I've put a star next to the thing I'm trying to find out. I really advise you do this in exam questions because it will help you just to make a bit more sense of it because sometimes the numbers can start to swirl around in our heads a bit and just doing that can help us to interpret things a bit more clearly. Now, notice also that my units, my volume units are both centimeters cubed this time, so I'm not going to need to convert anything. Now, I'm gonna start out by writing up my equation for cardiac output, so I'm gonna say CO equals so cardiac output equals stroke volume sv times heart rate hr okay now it says in the question my cardiac output is 5456 so i'm going to write that here 5456 equals now i don't know my stroke volume because that's what i'm trying to find out so i'm just going to leave that as sv multiplied by my heart rate which is given in the question as 88 BPM. So now I need to rearrange. Now, when to, to make SV the subject of this equation. Now, when we, re when we rearrange, I have to try and get the SV on its own by doing the inverse operation of what's been done to it. So SV at the moment is multiplied by 88. So I'm going to divide by 88. But in order to keep the equation equal on both sides, I must, um, I must, uh, divide both sides by 88. And if I do that, well, for the SV, multiplied by 88 and divided by 88 cancels out. So we're just left with SV on the one side. And on the other, on the other side, I've got 5,456 divided by 88. And that will give me a, um, a stroke volume of 62 centimeters cubed as my final answer. Okay, so now we need to explore how does the body respond during exercise? And this will bring together the stuff on respiration and the stuff on cardiac output as well. So during moderate exercise, and by moderate, we're talking probably, you know, something like um, walking, um, walking or perhaps a slow, uh, a slow jog. At that point, the body's energy demand increases because as we're moving, we need more energy to power that movement. And so therefore our muscles need to respire more quickly to provide this extra energy. Therefore, in order to enable more respiration to take place, we've got to breathe more deeply and rapidly to get more oxygen into the blood. And also the heart has to beat faster 
and stronger, i.e. the cardiac output has to increase to get the extra oxygen and to get more glucose to our cells to enable them to respire more quickly and also to carry that carbon dioxide away more quickly as well. And we can see that in the graph here on the, uh, on the right. So this is for an untrained person, this purple line. For an untrained person, their heart rate, you know, their resting heart rate stays fairly constant uh, when they're not exercising. And then as they start to exercise and their energy demand increases, you can see their heart rate rapidly increases and it stays high all the while that they're exercising. And then once they stop exercising, it gradually starts to return back to its normal resting level. If we compare that to a trained person, so someone who's regularly doing exercise and regularly challenging their heart and requiring their heart to, uh, to work hard, that means their heart will get stronger. And so the first thing to note is that their resting heart rate will be lower than for an untrained person. And that's because their heart is stronger and so it pumps more blood with each heart. Uh, so uh, so pump, pumps more blood with each beat and therefore it can get the same cardiac output for a lower heart rate, so it beats more slowly. Then, like with the untrained person, it rises during exercise, albeit to not such a high level, and then after the exercise, it returns to normal more quickly for, than for the untrained person because their heart is stronger. What about then during intense exercise? Intense exercise, we're talking something like sprinting, uh, or maybe you know carrying something very heavy or whatever it might be. So during that intense exercise, what happens then is that the circulatory system cannot supply enough oxygen and glucose to the muscles to meet the energy demand because we need a lot of energy during that intense exercise. So what happens then is that the muscles start to respire anaerobically as well as aerobically. And this causes the lactic acid levels in our um, blood to start rising and they rise more quickly the more intense the exercise that we're doing. Now this lactic acid causes fatigue and pain and that then limits the duration of that intense exercise. You know, even the fittest Olympian athlete really can't sprint for much more than about a minute before the pain and fatigue gets too much and they're forced to slow down. Again, we can see this uh, graphically um, if we look at the graph on the right here. So we can see that for our untrained athlete, um, they, uh, you know, when they're walking slowly, their lactic acid rem levels remain low. But as they start to exercise more and more and more, you can see their lactic acid levels tend start to rise quite quickly. And at some point, those levels become too high and they will have to ease off or stop altogether. Compare that to a trained person and you can see that as they speed up, their lactic acid levels increase much more slowly and that's because their heart is stronger so it's able to get more oxygen and more glucose to the cells more quickly to allow, to allow them to continue doing that aerobic respiration and less of the anaerobic respiration. So the last thing to look at is the respiration core practical. Now the aim of this was to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of respiration in small invertebrates. So we're talking insects or some other creature without the backbone. Now, to do this, first of all, we got a boiling tube and we added some soda lime into it. Now, soda lime is a chemical that will absorb carbon dioxide. And we placed it into a boiling tube with a cotton wool plug placed on top of it. So there we can see the soda lime at the bottom and then the cotton wool plug on top of it. Then what we did was we added 10 maggots or some other small invertebrate and we put them on top of the cotton wool. Now the cotton wool is there to prevent the maggots from making direct contact with the soda lime and that's for two reasons. Reason number one is that it will, it will kill them which is just cruel uh, and reason number two is that if they're dead then the experiment is kind of ruined. Next what we did was we got a rubber bung and capillary tube and we placed it in the top of the test tube and then we put the bottom of the test tube into a water bath at a set temperature so you know it might be 20 degrees 30 degrees 40 degrees but also we might use an ice bath to cool the temperature down as well and we left it in there for five minutes and that was just to make sure that everything was at the right temperature 
ready to start taking measurements. Then what we did was we got some coloured liquid. Uh, in this example, the liquid is red. We got some coloured liquid and we immersed the end of the capillary tube in that coloured liquid and we start the stopwatch. Then we wait for five minutes and after five minutes we stop the stopwatch and we measure the distance that the coloured liquid has been sucked up the capillary tube. And you can see that's happened there. So see how that red, red liquid has gone up the capillary tube. So we measure how far that red liquid has been sucked up. Okay. And then finally, we repeat the experiment at a range of different temperatures, making sure our other variables stay controlled. So we're using the, uh, the, the main thing is to make sure we're using the same invertebrates and the same number of those invertebrates as well. Now, our results for the restoration support practical look something like this. So we have the temperature and you can see 0, 10, 20, 30 and 40 degrees Celsius and the distance moved by the ink in millimetres. Um, and you can see it ranges from 0 up to 60. And the first thing to see from those results is that the higher the temperature, the further the ink moves. But we don't want just to see how far it moved. We want to actually measure the rate it's moved. So to get a rate, uh, any rate is dividing something by time. In this case, we'll divide the distance it moved by the time it took, which was five minutes. But you might not have done it for five minutes. So make sure you check your own results properly. Um, so let's let's check those rates then. So zero divided by five will give us a rate of zero millimeters per minute. One divided by five will give us a rate of 0 0.2 millimeters per minute. Five divided by five gives a rate of one millimeter per minute. 20 divided by 5 gives a rate of um, 4 millimetres per minute. And finally, 60 divided by 5 gives a rate of 15 millimetres per minute. To make it properly accurate, we should use the same number of decimal places. So we should make all those point zeros except for the 0 0.2 one. So that makes me happy like that. Good. Now, um, if we graph those with temperature on the... Uh, x-axis and the rate of respiration on the y-axis we get a graph like this that curves up it starts off gradual and then curves up quite steeply now why have we graphed it this way around well it's because temperature is our independent variable and so that always goes on the x-axis and the dependent variable the um, rate goes on the y-axis so let's try and explain our results so firstly the ink moves further as the temperature increases because the rate of respiration increases. Okay. Now, how is it? Why is the ink moving in this experiment? Well, as the uh, maggots respire, they produce carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is absorbed by the soda lime that's in the uh, that's in the test tube. That causes the volume of air in the test tube to decrease. So that then causes the coloured liquid to be sucked up. So the more carbon dioxide is produced, the more um, of it gets absorbed by the soda lime. So the more the volume of air decreases and so um, the more liquid that gets sucked up. Now, um, respiration is a chemical reaction. So at higher temperatures, the particles move faster. So there's an increased rate of successful collisions and that increases the rate of respiration. So this explains why the maggots respire more quickly at a higher temperature. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.